Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor for me as the Council for Culture and Business in Troms to be here with you today. Troms County is a proud partner in the Arctic frontiers, and I believe that this conference is the most important arena for discussion about development of the Arctic. Arctic Frontiers business is this session, but whose business is it? Who decides how to utilize the resources of the Arctic? What we can and cannot do. The foremost stakeholders of the Arctic are the Arctic people. That's us. And also we need to cooperate and adopt different perspectives from the rest of the world in order to make the best possible decisions. We live in a region full of natural resources. We have a strategic location. We have one of the longest shorelines in the world. Did you know that the Norwegian seafood export last year provided the equivalent of two meals to the entire world population? A huge part of this originates in the Arctic region, just a few miles from where we are right now. We have so many opportunities, but we also have challenges. Many of the speakers at this conference talk about the challenges of securing competence and skilled labor that they need. Troms is a region with all-time low unemployment rate. It's less than 2%, which is a good thing. But many companies point out that they need more people. The special environment, cold climate, long distances, and sparsely populated areas. We are now in Tromsø, which is the real urban Arctic. But not all of our regions are like this. However, the potential for growth is huge, and we have a lot of the confidence and know-how to deal with our challenging Arctic environment. The topic at this year's conference, Connecting the Arctic, is a very important issue for us in Troms County. Digitalization is not only about making sure every school child has a computer. For me, it is a revolution in how we interact with each other. Troms was the first region in Norway to build digital infrastructure connecting all the municipalities through high-speed fiber broadband. For further development, closer collaboration across the borders and looking into opportunities to connect the world in the circumpolar region is important. But this also gives us some challenges. For instance, the digitalization can make it more or less irrelevant where you are and where you live if only you have the digital infrastructure. Natural resources can be harvested and operated from far away. Take the oil and gas industry, aquaculture, mining industry. How do we make sure that the companies fulfill their social obligations if they can operate everything from one local central location wherever? These are issues that we need to put on the agenda much more often than today. If the competence in the education does not keep up with technology, the result is inequality. We cannot afford to not make sure that everyone is fit for the work life of tomorrow. We need all hands on deck, and it is our business. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much to Sigrid Ina Simonsen, um, a fantastic lady, a PhD in physics, a competent politician, and a reservoir engineer in stash oil. What's not to like? <laughs> thank you very much. Gentlemen, ladies, minister, 
We're delighted to have you here in the lovable and livable Arctic. Don't forget to take possession of the term Arctic. The Arctic is Tromsø. The Arctic is the populated northernmost part of Norway and all the other circumpolar countries. The Arctic is lived in, it's loved in, and uh, we work here. My name is Liv Monika Stubolt. I'm a partner in law firm Selmer, and today and tomorrow I will do what I like best, and that is to discuss and promote business opportunities in the Arctic. And my first and delightful job is to introduce the Minister of Petroleum and Energy, and I will say a few words uh, about him, because he's perfectly designed for the purpose of Arctic Frontiers business. And why is that? Well, we talk about the ocean. The ocean is vast, the opportunities are huge, and the politics, politics provide the limitations to make sure that business is growth for everyone. But why are you perfect, Tarja Serviknes, apart from the obvious uh, reasons? Uh, firstly, you're an aqua uh, trained person, you're an aqua engineer. You've also been an independent entrepreneur, uh, a businessman, and uh, been uh, a fisherman on his own boat. And not only that, he has a cunning ability to get re-elected. <laughs> This is something which is very popular capability in politics, I have to say. For our international guests, this man has been re-elected as the mayor of Oos municipality five times. <laughs> Tarja, no wonder that you are called the Wizard of Oz, please. Oh, thank you very much for the invitation and, of course, uh, a beautiful uh, introduction. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here at the Arctic Frontiers. The High North uh, is a focal point for uh, the Norwegian government, the government uh, and a dedicated uh, policy for the region is established and operationalized. Central elements in this policy are presence, knowledge and sustainable uh, development to promote economic growth and welfare to the benefit of uh, the region, but also for the Norwegian society as a whole. Long-term prudent management of natural resources is an important tool in realizing this policy. Due to the Gulf Stream transporting uh, warm water from the Gulf of Mexico, along the coast of Norway, living conditions in the Norwegian high north are very different from those at the same latitude in the US, Canada, Russia or Greenland. In the northern part of Norway, people live, love and uh, work as they do elsewhere in our country. The Gulf Stream is also the reason why the Norwegian Sea and the southern part of the Baron, uh, Norwegian Barents Sea are, um, have more favorable uh, operational conditions for petroleum activities than in other parts uh, of the Arctic. In Norway, petroleum activities uh, take place offshore on the continental shelf only. And these slides give you an overview of the role the petroleum sector plays among the uh, ocean industries. Norway has uh, significant untapped oil and gas resources in the Norwegian Barents Sea, as much as 65% uh, of uh, the undiscovered uh, oil and gas resources in Norway are estimated to be in this region. Our Arctic uh, waters were formally uh, open for petroleum activities in 1979, and uh, more than 140 exploration wells have been drilled in the area, and several discoveries has been made. Two fields are in production in the Barents Sea. Snøvit was the first field to be developed and started production in 2007. Snøvit is a gas field and is developed uh, as a subs, uh, subsea tieback to shore. Goliath was the first oil field to be developed in the Barents Sea. Goliath started production in 2016 and was a milestone on the Norwegian continental shelf. 
is the first production facility above the sea surface in our northern, northernmost region. Johan Kastberg is the largest oil discovery in the Barents Sea, and it's uh, located 240 kilometers uh, offshore. The licensees uh, submitted a plan for development and operation, a PDO, in December, and production startup is expected in uh, 2022. The discoveries uh, of Visting and uh, Alta Gota are the next expected uh, development projects. The licensees aim to submit PDOs in the coming years. For the government, access to new acreage, acreage is vital for maintaining production and value creation from our petroleum activities. We therefore award new acreage to qualified oil companies on a regular basis. Last week, we offered uh, a total of 75 new exploration licenses, of which eight are in the Barren Sea. It was a record, the highest number of licenses in one licensing round ever during our 50 years of oil and gas production in Norway. Also, the 24th licensing round is uh, in process, and we expect uh, awards before summer. The petroleum industry gives a unique opportunity for value creation, economic uh, growth, and employment in the northern part of Norway. The activities have uh, rendered uh, large and positive ripple effects. Societies are prospering, people migrate, migrate uh, to the region, and new industries are established. The existing fields and new development projects will create employment and benefit the supply industry, both locally and nationally in Norway for decades to come. And I believe it's fully achievable to have uh, petroleum activities and at the same time fulfilling the Par Paris Agreement. Norway remains uh, at the forefront globally when it comes to standards for health, safety and environmental uh, protection in the petroleum activities. And we are at the forefront of technological development, enabling to use, uh, us to meet new challenges in the future. And Norway will continue to work actively to ensure a long-term, stable, prudent and sustainable management of the petroleum resources in the high north. And now there is uh, a new optimism in the oil and gas industry. On one side, we have uh, increased uh, oil prices, and uh, on the other side, an impressive uh, cost reductions uh, in the whole value chain. We can conclude that um, the Norwegian continental shelf has strengthened its uh, competitiveness. That's also the case in the high north. And of course, this will uh, provide further business opportunities for companies in the region and for Norway as a whole. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much to the minister and thank you uh, for sharing some of the perspectives uh, from the Norwegian point of view. We will now open the floor to a new and interesting player that hasn't really been uh, on the podium at Arctic Frontiers up until today, and that is the Russian oil company Novatek. I'm delighted to introduce Deputy Director for Development Projects, LNG, and that is uh, Björn Gunnarsson. Uh, he is uh, a man who belongs to the oil and gas community in Norway, whereby you identify primarily by virtue of the projects you've been part of as much as the companies that you worked for. And um, Björn Gunnarsson has been part of three key uh, circumpolar Arctic projects. It is Melkøya, Statoil. It is... Um, GBS, gravity-based structures uh, for ExxonMobil on Sakhalin, on uh, the Far East uh, Russia, and now Northwest Russia, uh, Arctic LNG. Bjorn, uh, the podium is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Minister, 
uh, everyone. Uh, I'm proud to be here to uh, present Novatek, a uh, Russian uh, gas company. It's the second biggest Russian gas company, uh, after Gazprom, of course. And we are the biggest uh, independent uh, company. It's a fairly young company, was formed in 1994 by Mr. Leonid Mikkelsen. Uh, he is still our chairman of the management board. Uh, and in 2004, we somehow step changed the uh, expansion of the, uh, of the company, and the company was listed in the London and Moscow stock exchanges. We are focusing on environmental friendly uh, energies. We are focusing on gas. Um, and we are now uh, step changing uh, our own ambitions going forward to not only become a, or be a local Russian uh, gas company, but to become a global gas company by developing LNG uh, projects going forward. As I said, we are a small company. Uh, we are a young company, so we're very much focusing on tapping into um, global center of excellency, global center of excellence in technology, in engineering, and in project executions. So currently we are working with um, uh, Technip company, we are working with Saipem company, we are working with Linde of Germany, we are working with also Norwegian companies. We are working with Ola Olsen and NGI, very specialist companies when it comes to the GBS, concrete GBS uh, business. And we are working on a range of um, other companies as well. So from the Norwegian continental shelf uh, to maybe one of the biggest continental shelves in the world, uh, for sure the biggest one in the Arctic, in the Russian continental shelf, and some of the Russian is very close, as you know, to, to the Norwegian continental shelves. Russia is not only the biggest country in the world, but it's also one of the most energy-rich uh, countries uh, in the world as well. And our reserves, uh, when it comes to gas, is mainly focused in the area where you see here, the Amal and Gidan Peninsula uh, area. The production we have done uh, since um, 2005, when we stepped changed the growth of the company, was in the southern part of these uh, clusters of uh, gas deposits. And now we are turning up to the Gedan and Yamal peninsulas where we are developing uh, the first uh, LNG uh, project in the Arctic uh, Russia, the Yamal LNG project, which is located here. I'm working now on the Arctic LNG 2 project, which is even bigger than the, uh, the first one. And we have resources now uh, to be able to feed, we think, three or four similar projects going, uh, going forward. But uh, first, a small uh, snap, uh, Snapchat from, uh, from our Yamal LNG project. So this is a uh, LNG project uh, in the onshore uh, shoreline of, uh, of Yamal Peninsula. We are building a LNG capacity uh, of 16.5 million tons per year. If you compare with Snövit, I worked on the Snövit, as Le Monica said as well, Snövit, I think, is 4.3 million uh, tons uh, per year. And this is then uh, three trains, and each of them are 5.5 million tons per year. We launched the first one, the first LNG uh, tanker left uh, Sabeta in 8th of December, and now we have three LNG uh, tankers uh, uh, in operation uh, by uh, taking the LNG from the first train. So this is then the onshore plant. It is three trains, uh, altogether 16.1. Uh, so who are we here? We are Novatec, 50.1%. We are Total, French Total company. We are two Chinese uh, partners as well, CNPC, and then Silk Road uh, Foundation. And Total is also owner, a uh, part owner of uh, Novatec itself uh, by uh, 20, uh, 20 uh, we had more than 30,000 people working at the plant uh, during, uh, during peak. Uh, and we had a lot of good lesson learned. So when we are now starting the second project uh, of uh, our uh, uh, road towards 2030, becoming a global gas uh, company, 
we decided to change the concept. So now we are building an LNG plant on top of a concrete GBS, similar to what we did in the North Sea in the 70s and 80s. It's just a different GBS, but it's holding the top side. The top side in this sense is 125,000 tons of top side modularized uh, structures. Uh, and we will put all that on top of the GBS and inside the concrete caisson, there will be all sorts of um, liquid storages. LNG will be stored there, condensate will be stored there and 16 other different uh, fluids will be uh, stored there. And then we are building the whole project in a industrial area, which is the next slide, and installing it on the shoreline of Gedan Peninsula. We are minimizing the effect of environmental interaction uh, with, the, uh, with the onshore facilities compared to what we did on Yamal uh, to a minimum. Because we will build these structures uh, then complete in a new built uh, uh, construction site in Murmansk. So this is then the construction site. We have been planning this work now for four years. We started the construction of the uh, Murmansk uh, uh, LNG construction site in uh, August this year. We have, li we have carried already 3 million cubic meters of rock and soil. And we are working first and foremost now to one of these uh, big uh, dry docks uh, to uh, accommodate the first plant that will be started construction in summer 2019. Um, There's only one more left. Um, and, and this is then uh, a construction site where we build both the GBSs, concrete GBSs, similar to what we did in Stavanger in the 70s and 80s. It is also then the construction site where we build a significant part of the, of the top side modules uh, as well in, uh, in this area. And then uh, I will conclude my presentation since Limonica are then uh, pushing me uh, to a conclusion. And it's interesting, I mean, with this conference as well, it's interesting because this is actually on the doorstep to Norway. Murmansk is two hours drive from Murmansk to Kirkenes. I've done it many, uh, many times. I think this is a huge opportunity talking about connecting people. Shouldn't only connect people then in northern Norway and northern and southern Norway and in, uh, in the Nordic countries, but this is then on the doorstep to uh, northern Norway, it's on the doorstep to Norway, it's on the doorstep to Finland and to Sweden, to the whole Nordic. So I think it's a huge opportunity uh, in there for companies and individuals that want to, uh, to join this uh, exciting and challenging uh, journey. But of course, we are lifting this project in an environment where the oil and gas price is still almost 50% of what it was at peak. But with the uh, current setup, we are confident that we can compete in any uh, oil and G press uh, in, the, in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Bjorn Gunnarsson. We like opportunities and we want to compete with the best. Now, in this morning, there, was, there were several sessions trying to highlight how policy will be impacted by science. Now, I think it's important also to bring in the aspect that science will impact policies. And we have the perfect man to share uh, those views with us, um, uh, Professor Dr. Eberhard Sauter. He is at the Alfred Wegener Institute, uh, and he is head of technology transfer office there. He's also the representative for the Association, the German Association for Marine Technology. So he wears both hats, please. Dr. Thanks Sauter. very much, Liv Monika, and for this nice introduction. I am uh, glad to be here, to have the opportunity to speak to you to today. And in my contribution, I would like to focus on the second part of the session description. Uh, maybe you have read it. How can we make sure that industries, R&D and governmental institutions work jointly towards a responsible economic development of the Arctic? And how do we ensure that we have the best possible knowledge when creating trade opportunities in the Arctic? My proposition at that place uh, in respect to this is uh, especially um, for new businesses and um, they have, of course, and business cases, they have to be, of course, to be sustainable. And that includes that physical and ecological boundary conditions uh, of a changing Arctic have to be taken into 
account, as we have heard many times. And those uh, can be delivered or described also uh, by the pi uh, scientific party, and this is one of the duties of, of, this, uh, of science in particular. Obviously, this requires an intensive cross-sectional dialogue between all parties involved. Academia, including basic research, but also uh, applied develop, uh, R&D, and the private sector, of course, but also governmental institutions uh, and intergovernmental ones uh, when it comes to regulations. And last but not least, uh, also the involvement of other stakeholders, such as local communities, are crucial for such a cross-sectional um, exchange. Um, the sketch of uh, no the knowledge triangle I uh, showed here um, just gives you an idea about some of the elements of such a multidirectional knowledge and technology transfer. As you see, R&D results can be turned into on, uh, innovations, coming, of course, not only from uh, academia, but also, uh, of course, from, from the private sector itself. Um, but uh, this technology uh, transfer in this direction is very crucial to, uh, to fuel also new businesses and new innovation and uh, startups and so on. And so we uh, need to make sure that this interface can be worked at uh, properly. It's also evident uh, that uh, latest technological achievements have to enter higher education in order to provide skilled professionals uh, for the private sector that is meant with this uh, direction here. And um, however, as it often turns out, or as it is uh, always, it's all about people. And uh, that means communication. You can see these arrows. That has to do a lot with connectivity between the different parties uh, which have to interact. And um, this is, uh, in my view, key to overcome sector boundaries which occur um, rather often still. Another aspect is, of course, that high environmental standards um, are to be aimed for in the de development of new businesses. And, uh, but high tech is normally quite costly and therefore governmental and intergovernmental institutions have to create a framework to make uh, such uh, um, technologies uh, or such high standards mandatory also for all players in the field in order to avoid market distortions. Now I would like to give you uh, a few examples to illustrate <coughs> what we are doing in this uh, transfer from the Alfred Wegener Institute uh, towards, uh, uh, to, towards the private sector. Although we have uh, the aim to decrease the dependency on hydrocarbon fuels on the long term, it's realistic to assume that oil and gas will still be produced in and transported through the Arctic, as we have heard already and uh, is also used to fuel ships and generators in, in remote areas, remote villages over the next years. The methodologies to combat oil spills in ice-infested waters are, however, very limited. Basically, the options uh, are, to, uh, are in situ burning um, or uh, application of mechanical, mechanic oil skimmers and uh, the use of dispersant uh, chemicals. But as you see, um, in, an, in ice-infested waters, this is quite difficult to achieve. Um, at the Alfred Wegener Institute, uh, a methodology was developed which bases on microbial degradation of hydrocarbons by native cold adapted by bacteria. Those organisms naturally occur in regional environments, but in very low abundances only. Therefore, they are, according to our method, extracted, cultivated and implemented on environmentally com compatible carrier materials, such as seaweed products, and they can be brought into the field by planes and ships, in the case of an oil spill. And we are now currently about to transfer this uh, technology uh, together with the Arctic Domain Awareness Center of the University of uh, Alaska in Anchorage, to uh, bring it to application readiness. In the lower part, you see just a spin-off of an uh, ice service uh, company spinned out from the Alfred Wegener Institute's ice uh, group. 
And uh, the last I would like to uh, just to show you is uh, the, uh, a collection of uh, the member companies of the uh, German Association for Marine Technologies, uh, where also innovative uh, and science-based businesses are um, emerging. Um, on the uh, left side here is a, um, a com company uh, who, together with the Association of Arctic Expedition Cruise Operators, uh, yeah, skills or um, certifies um, cruise operators <coughs> and, uh, for touristic purposes. Others are shown here uh, to, uh, who make uh, engineering of, uh, let's say, modular Arctic hubs. Uh, which, are, uh, which facilitate uh, infrastructure development in remote areas and which provide then a mobile base for logistic interventions and also for rescue, uh, evacuation and um, escape actions. And finally, uh, the lower pictures uh, just illustrate from uh, Sea Ice Offshore and Arctic Solutions Company together with Hamburg Ship Model Basin, uh, the development of infrastructures also uh, to work in, uh, with offshore structures in ice-infested waters. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Sauter. And um, let's move quickly on to the need to reshape and reformat what energy companies do. One such company, a Nordic energy company, Fortum, has really uh, changed the last few years and become more and something else uh, than the starting point. We're pleased to have uh, Per Langer here. He is the executive vice president of City Solutions of Fortum, and he is in charge then for uh, the um, energy provided with waste and recycling, heating, cooling, but more than that, the uh, solar economy and R&D is also on its list of things to do in Fortum. Please, Per. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. This message is a message you see every year. This coming from a often a UK-based. And it's quite depressive. What it says is that from August we steal from our children. And the only way to fix this is recycling. We, have, we don't have abundant of resources, some will end, and we just need to recycle. And we become more and more. We have some kind of a perception about what recycling is and, and what it will be. One angle to it is that we believe we save energy. But that's the opposite. For recycling, we need a lot of energy. So we will need to feed this system with more energy. And luckily, technology development has supported us for the last 10 years into renewables. And this is sun. I don't believe sun will be up here. But sun and wind has become one of the driver to get cheap energy. I believe you will see more wind up here because more energy will be needed to recycle. The other part, wind and sun doesn't work all the time. So connectivity is important. Customer flexibility will be the key issue to handle sun and wind. More infrastructure, build better grid, and then it will work. Then we have the backlog. This is CO2 in at the atmosphere, it, and it's, you see it starts to move. The red dot is measurement from Hawaii, the blue dot is uh, uh, the South Pole. And then you see by years it's going up and down. Somewhere here I started to study, I studied thermodynamic and exergy, how to use energy. Why I bring this up is that we need to fix from some angle, we need to, to fix recycling, renewables, that's for the future. But we also have a huge backlog that we need to discuss what to do. If you take all this together, when I meet young people, when I go to, I work to my daughter's classroom, I would say that when you bring everything together, we are almost like we be, become afraid of the future. It looks so bad. 
And when we become afraid of the future, the future becomes small. And when the future becomes small, there is no place for our, our dreams. So we need to solve all these things at the same time. Recycling, renewables, and the backlog. And it's, it's moving, it's quite scary to, to, to look at. See where we are, 2007. So my, my point is, and then when, what can we do about this? One angle is stop using petrols. I mean, hydrocarbons. Is it likely? No. It would be very, very difficult. I, I used to say, no one likes coal, but everyone wants to go to continental Europe for holiday. And without coal, there will be no electricity. And if we, if we don't produce electricity, we cannot even go there. So from some angle, we live in the reality of what can we do and what can we not do. This, we can plant tree, we can work with CCS, or we can stop. From these two angles, we have the choices. Now you go deeper, now you will come from ice core. But when, when you look at this graph, you need to, uh, to look at this from, from the holistic point of view. Look at the future, do the renewables that's possible, recycling, and then go from the time perspective. What do we need to do and what insurance do we need to have to continue? I believe it's doable, but that's from the angle that we have to create the view that we actually do the utmost we can. And when we do that, we create the future for ourselves and the possibility to do something about it. Renewable is a blessing for this, and renewable will make it cheap and doable. But we need to change some system. With that, thank you very much. <laughs> and if you're into this, I've taken from YouTube, so it's 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 CU2 pump handle, so it's 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 available. Thank you very much, uh, Per. Uh, very thought-provoking indeed. And I am now delighted to move on to understanding the role of business also in the regional and local communities. And we're delighted to have, I dare say, uh, Timo, uh, grand old man, uh, Timo Rautoyoki, who is the, uh, on uh, close to 30 years, he's been the CEO of Lapland Chamber of Commerce. I think that's quite impressive. You've seen some developments and we're keen to see what is your take on the future now? Tim. <coughs> Thank you very much for this uh, introduction. And uh, actually, uh, when I'm uh, thinking about the regional cooperation here, it uh, used to be called, and is still called, North Cloud Cooperation. I started it uh, uh, in August uh, uh, 1983 here in uh, Tromsø, so it's 35 years. I'm looking. I was I was I was quite a young man at that time, but but uh, the possibilities are the same, but also the challenges are are the same. So uh, after a long recession time, business looks looks very fine, and uh, and the, and the future is promising and uh, the long expected investments have been have been moving on so uh, it looks very positive from uh, uh, my region Lapland uh, uh, it, it uh, uh, the growth has been uh, started about two years ago and uh, uh, I think that uh, the biggest growth has been uh, in tourism it's, uh, we have been very important tourism region, region for, for um, Finland uh, uh, many decades, but, but now the growth is it's, uh, still last year, it was more, more than 20% more than of the, of the uh, uh, international tourists and this process is going on. We don't, we don't know what is the result, but, but winter has been the main, our main season 
and it seems to be so that, that, that it's going to happen, happen year round. And that uh, has brought us to a new situation. We have also have been facing the lack of skilled labor. So, so it's, uh, it's uh, from the area of, of uh, bad unemployment we are, we are moving, moving to that direction. Forest industry is, is back. So we have, uh, we have uh, a very big forest industry in, in, in Lapland and we have investment projects, two Chinese projects in, in Kemi and Kemijärvi. And, and also mining and metal industry is, is going, going strongly. There are mine expansions and, and exploration and, and, and prospecting is, is growing all the time. And uh, today we can say that, that uh, with the Northern Sweden, Norrbotten, uh, our business is uh, like, like normal European Union in a market, market uh, uh, business. And uh, uh, of course, uh, we are following uh, uh, what is happening in northern Norway and the news about Johan Kasperi and what is, what is happening here is important for, uh, for us. And uh, uh, I'm very glad that, that Russia was presented er, uh, here, here also and, and the Murmansk region. There is this Novatec pro project is very, very interesting and also, also mining, with mining technology, there is, there is good part for cooperation. But there are some some challenges, uh, uh, some political challenges. I don't go to go through those, but uh, but uh, 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 but uh, uh, this climate change is is on the other hand, of course, it's a serious thing. But but there is a very strong environmental lobby going on, and and uh, we already yesterday heard that there should be no investments and less business. This is something question about information. Uh, people even in Helsinki don't know what's really happening in Lapland. So we must tell more about us uh, in Europe and all over the world that, that we have a long, long industrial uh, background, more than 100 years, for instance, in Lapland. And then uh, about regional cooperation. I think that it is, it is a very important part here, but, but uh, 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 yesterday we talked about connectivity. Uh, connectivity here in High North, it's, it's, it's more than technology. And I have seen that uh, regional cooperation has been coming a little bit down. Uh, for instance, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had the 25th anniversary of Barents cooperation. And I didn't notice any, any celebration regarding that. I hope that there is going to happen, happen that, but, uh, but, uh, but we should more meet each other. And one big problem we have, we don't know what is, what is uh, happening. We, we, we cannot not, uh, uh, read the news, for, for instance, uh, from northern Norway, because most of the media has, has paywalls. So there is a lack of information what is happening inside, inside the society. So Odessat is, is, is the only one. Only one. So uh, I think that, that we must uh, some, somehow uh, restart this, this regional cooperation. And, and uh, the, these are big challenges we have here. And we, the best way to solve it is, is uh, to do it together. And we definitely must not forget uh, uh, Murmansk region, Arhangelsk region, and, and our Russian Arctic. Thank you very much. I need to move over and sit there at the far end. Please, can I have uh, all speakers on the podium, please? And I'd like the minister to sit in the middle. Later on. Gentlemen, we don't have a lot of time. I mean, five minutes is so painful for <laughs> all an individual. Each individual, but I can share with you, it's painful for us too, but because you all have so much interesting to share with us. But that means I'm going to challenge you to be quick and interesting again. <laughs> okay? So, I would like to try to capture Per Langer's dream. I would like to make the future big again. So, I'd like to start with the minister. You hold in your hands not only oil and gas, but renewable 
the environmental technology of carbon capture, the support schemes in ANOVA, you hold the future, a big part of the future for Norway in your ministry. How do you think that you can help make the future big again for the young people in Norway? I think we have to do uh, it uh, together. Um, and of course, uh, the climate issue is, uh, is a large issue and a lot of young people are concerned about the future, but we have to give them, uh, give them hope and uh, show that we can be able to produce more renewable energy. Um, the development of uh, solar and wind have been impressive over the last year, cost reductions. And uh, in Norway, at the moment, we are uh, developing uh, more renewables than uh, for the last 25 years. So we are doing a lot on, on that issue as well, especially wind, but also more hydropower. So um, the world will, uh, will need more energy and we have to work together. Uh, and as a minister of uh, uh, petroleum and energy in Norway, we have the, uh, the CCS uh, agenda high, high up. Uh, we need carbon capture and storage to meet uh, the goals in the Paris Agreement. And uh, we are now working on this uh, full-scale uh, project with uh, capture from uh, one, two or three uh, industrial uh, factories uh, and uh, then transporting the, the captured CO2 to um, the western coast of Norway and uh, storage it uh, under the seabed in the North Sea. So it would be an important project, not only for Norway, of course, business opportunities in the long term. Uh, it's costly at the moment, but the new technology and bringing the cost down uh, might uh, be, be the start of a new industrial uh, adventure for, for Norway, and it's uh, extremely uh, important uh, in a global uh, uh, picture. Thank you, Minister. I'd like to ask you, uh, Dr. Sauta, um, I'm thinking you meet a lot of young people with a lot of high uh, hopes and big dreams. Uh, how do you assess what business people do? Do we go about it the right or the wrong way to attract them into understanding that you can actually work green in all industries if you come to the right companies? I think it's, it has to do also with uh, working at these interfaces and uh, we at the universities also try to interlink uh, the students uh, together to the, to the industry companies. Uh, for instance, uh, doing master thesis and so on or uh, internships and so on. And uh, I think it is very important for both sides to get insights in the other uh, sector and for, for young people, what does these businesses really mean uh, at every day uh, on an everyday scale and um, and also to uh, not only to be um, trapped in the academic thinking but also to to think uh, to to look over the the fence and uh, and have f fresh ideas and uh, sometimes also these uh, young people can uh, be very fruitful for for companies because they have new ideas and bring it bring it bring it in but the the key is bring them together and there are of course um, yeah, business evenings at the universities or uh, also um, um, the association uh, associations uh, play an important role because uh, not everybody has the time to at attend all the meetings. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Per Lange, I heard you say that we need to do it all at the same time. If I asked a communication expert, <laughs> he or she would say, that's a very difficult message to bring, to do everything at the same time. How do you, as a representative of Fortum, try to hone the message about everything? I, th I think if I start with renewables, renewables is happening and we don't really see the huge change. Renewables has been driven from environmental perspective. In the future, it will be also be competitive. So, so it's, it's, it's going from one element and it's going so quick. And what happens when we do that? We're going from seeing energy or uh, the, the, as long as it was only hydrocarbons, it was a scarcity game. Now it doesn't, it, it disappears. It is, it, the question is, what do we do with, with it? And what do we do with the energy? Well, as, as a society, we can do more. And that's a fundamental shift. 
And we need to do more. We need to do more salt water to fresh water. We need to f do more fertilizer. So, so many of the angles, we have to do more. So in some sense, I think this is coming by itself, but we don't see it today. If I travel India, China, it's really, really a paradigm shift. Uh, I believe we need to look at it from a more co cohesive view, because otherwise we start cherry picking. We, we start to compete, we say, we only want to do that because that is more profitable. And this is the change in this going to from renewables, recycling, is, is a, it's so much of it's difficult to do cherry picking. So that's why I believe it will come as, as a change. And, for, for, and I believe also we need to address the curve of CO2 for, I, for my children. Imagine, imagine it goes wrong and I say, we took a gamble. We didn't do everything we could. I, we don't know exa exactly how this will turn out. 450, we say, is two degrees. But imagine just standing there and say, we didn't do it because we hoped it would turn some, somewhere else. It's, it's, it's difficult to defend. It's, yeah, it's a reality. Björn. You represent a huge project today, so big in terms of reserves and opportunities and money that it's almost hard to grasp. Seeing that from Northwest Russia and having different oil service providers and partners work with you, um, what would you wish for in terms of understanding what the future will bring in Yamal the next 20 years? How would you like to change the perception of what is going on, if you could? Um, I would like to start with the uh, invitation for my Finnish colleague. I mean, I think he said something about starting then the, I mean, the, the Barents Corporation again, starting the uh, High North Corporation. I mean, revitalize uh, all these good intention and the good work that have been going on for decades. Because I feel now, of course, based on different, uh, uh, different um, reasons, that of course a lot of this activity have been fading out somewhat over the last uh, five years. And it's a pity, because the biggest oil and gas development in the world are now taking place in, uh, in Murmansk. And, uh, uh, and uh, my wish there is to make sure, uh, is to try to contribute, and I really wish that we will be able to revitalize the sister city uh, arrangement. For instance, I'm from Stavanger myself. I saw how Stavanger transformed in the 70s and 80s. Uh, um, and then to see that sister relationship uh, taking part again with Murmansk. It's in interesting when I looked at the um, presentation of Arctic Frontier this year, I saw this pole, this sign pole that was placed in Kirkenes and had these signs to uh, Oslo and I think to <coughs> India and to Lisbon, <coughs> Rome was there, but Murmansk was not there. If it was not just behind the pole and you didn't see it from that photo. And I think now, I mean, it's um, Norwegian, Nordic um, technology uh, 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 companies and, uh, and organizations uh, should try to now position to take part in this, to benefit of all, to benefit of Novatec, to benefit of the, uh, of the development, and for intercultural relationship. I remember also 10, 15 years ago, with all the university relationship that went on, I think, to a higher, uh, um, to a higher activity than today for maybe understandable reasons, but when we have the political environment shaping up like it is today, I think it's even more important with business to business and people to people contact than ever before, and it will be to the benefit of all, I think. Indeed. Thank you. I noted yesterday that uh, Mayor of Sörvarang and Rune Raufholsen said that Kirkenes is the new Singapore, and uh, Björn Gunnarsson has just announced that Murmansk will be the new Stavanger. So I think we are uh, mm -hmm. making, we're shaping geography today. Um, Timo, um, it's interesting to hear your comment about the potential and the felt obstacles to business development cross-border. And it really 
in an ideal world, should have been cancelled out by um, cross-sector, cross-border cooperation. If you could tell us just one thing that you think would be extremely helpful to cancel in terms of cross-border obstacles, what would you zoom in on? I think that it's uh, uh, this uh, uh, general political uh, atmosphere that, that uh, there are some countries, okay, let's say Russia, like we yesterday heard, there is, there is, we, are talking, we are talking about Russia like it's, it's out there. Uh, they are our neighbors, so, uh, and we know them, there are a lot of our friends. Uh, let's 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 take contact again. Let's go there. Let's meet. Let let's let's start to talk. We are we are all inhabitants of the Arctic. We are the people. That we are mostly people are talking about us. So let's talk together. I think that's the that's the first and best way to solve solve the big, uh, some obstacles. Well, thank you very much to the panel. I will, in the uh, service of time, I will uh, dismiss the panel and we will move on. We have a few minutes to move to the next great group of speakers. Please give the panelists a big hand.